Audio Parfait. Welcome back to Open a Fucking Book. Yeah. We are on episode two of the series of Mark Twain. All right. Well, last time we left off, uh, we left with the birth of his last child, Jean. And right after this, we will get to The Prince and the Pauper. It was published in 1881 in Canada, then here in the U.S. in 1882. It was his first attempt at historical fiction. Uh, set in 1537, tells the story of two young boys who were born on the same day, identical in appearance. Uh, Tom Canty, a pauper who lives with his abusive alcoholic father in Offal Court off Pudding Lane in London. The most English thing I've ever said probably in my life. <laughs> and Edward VI of England, son of Henry VIII of England. Um, my first introduction to Prince and the Pauper was not through Mark Twain's book. It was actually through a Mickey Mouse cartoon. I don't know if you ever saw that, but it was it was yeah, it yeah. was only a half an hour long or something. I rented it from kids back in the day there were these things called video stores where you could rent VHS tapes. Go and, Blockbuster. And you could that was from the video shop of oh, town. Yeah. The mom and, and pop ones. Uh huh. And uh, you put it in a thing called a VCR. It's very low tech. But it was only like a half an hour long. And uh, so that's how I learned about Prince. I had no idea he wrote it until later on. I just thought it was a story Disney came up with. But that was, well, I was like eight or nine. Um, I think I've actually heard about the story through other forms of literature from like Aesop Fables and other forms, you know, similar stories to that. Right. Well, think and something that our listeners might not know is uh, when we got into this, you you're the the book nerd, and I'm more of the large child that watches cartoons to find out about literature. Yes. So, um, anyway, uh, Twain wanted to follow up Sawyer. Now, he had started a sequel, but found it was more difficult than he anticipated. So he shelved it, turned to Prince and the Pauper. Uh, couple reasons people think he really wrote this one was for his daughters they were his favorite audience at the time uh, he even dedicated it to them uh, he wanted something that they would find entertaining another reason possibly he wrote it was his own experience coming from poor to being rich always wanting to live that lifestyle that he wasn't exposed to when he was a, a, a kid then 1883 Life on the Mississippi, a memoir of his days as a steamboat pilot on the Mississippi River before the Civil War. And we go back again to the whole, he likes to post, he likes to write things that happened before the Civil War. Uh, it was also another travel book recounting his trips along the Mississippi River from St. Louis to New Orleans many years after the war. So he, he doesn't really cover the war as much as he goes before and then way after. Maybe he had PSTD and didn't want to really he relive only, that. He only spent two weeks in a militia. They and they didn't even fight. They drilled and then they get then they went their separate ways. And he went out west and started paying for gold. But who knows what's going on in the mind of somebody? Uh, the well, book he did have issues because of all the death he had to deal with. That's true. He 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 did deal with a lot of death, and he's got a lot of death more to deal with as we go on. Uh, the book begins with a brief history of the river, starting with Hernando de Sato in 1542. It continues with anecdotes of Twain's training as a steamboat pilot as the cub or apprentice under Horace Bix Bixby. Uh, he talks about the science of navigating the ever-changing Mississippi River in a section that was first published in 1876 entitled Old Times on the Mississippi. Even though he was actually 21 when he began his training, he used artistic license to make himself seem somewhat younger, referring to himself as a fledgling and a boy who ran away from home to seek his fortune on the river. So not so much artistic license as just lying. I mean, a lie's a lie no matter how you spin it. <laughs> I mean, I get it. it it's, it's autobiographical to a point. It's semi-autobiographical. 
a lot of people have done that when they write about themselves or they, they want to use themselves as the subject but don't want to want to spice up their life a little bit mark twain is not somebody who i think would need to spice up his own life through telling stories because his his life was already kind of crazy the way it was but you live your life and you kind of look back at it and go eh it's not that big of a deal well if you actually think about it his life was boring it was his family members around him that had the interesting lives that made his work so impeccable and interesting to read with all the trap i wouldn't say his life was boring but i I don't. I guess it's not as exciting as what other people's lives are. Some authors that we'll cover, you know, in the following weeks, they had some interesting lives to their own detriment. But I mean, I, I could I could see where you're what you're saying. And most people look at their own lives and go, "Eh, it's boring" because they lived it. But when you hear the story, it's holy shit! What the fuck? And you're like, "Eh, it's a living." Uh, uh, in the second half, he narrates his trip many years later on a steamboat from St. Louis, New Orleans. He describes the competition from railroads, uh, the new larger cities, and adds his observation on greed, gullibility, tragedy, bad architecture. Uh, he also tells some stories that are most likely tall tales. Go figure, Mark Twain's going to tell everybody a tall tale. Yeah. It's a book. I mean, now, Sam actually established his own publishing firm in 1885. And he put his nephew, by marriage, Charles Webster, in charge. The first book published by the firm were the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant and the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. The success of these two books are, set a pretty high expectations, which never were matched. In 1888, Charles Webster was forced out of the company and replaced by Fred J. Hall. And in April 1894, the firm experienced financial failure. Yeah, uh, I don't know if a lot of people know that he had a publishing firm. It was um, Webster and Company. Um, it survived for a while. It, like I said, put out two huge books. I mean, and we'll we'll get to the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant a little bit later, and Huck Finn's coming up here in a few minutes. Uh, but these books turned out to be, I mean, for the time, gigantic books, and for a company that just fail after that. There's a lot of people behind the scenes doing a lot of things they weren't supposed to be doing, uh, embezzling money. So, I don't know, it'd be like Penguin Imagine that in business. the 1800s, though. I suppose. I mean, it's a lot harder to follow the, the money trail back then than what it is now. Now, all modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. Famously declared in 1935 by what other author? I'm, I'm asking Stephanie. I want to see. What other? And this is in 1935. Big author back then. I'm getting a blank stare. She's trying. Oh, she's trying. Can't think it. Yeah. Ernest Hemingway. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> it's the best book we've had. All American writing comes from that. There was nothing before. He would go on to say some shit about Melville and uh, point at a few other authors, but his main focus was how amazing Huckleberry Finn is as a book. Um, so let's get into it. Some would say the biggest book he ever wrote. You know, a lot of people say, oh, it's Tom Sawyer. Without Tom Sawyer, there is no Huck Finn. Most people would point to Huck Finn, if not anything but just the controversy that was around it for so long and still is Huck Finn is probably the biggest book he ever wrote uh, it was first published in the United Kingdom in December in 1884 then in the United States in February 1885 it's commonly named among the great American novels the work is among the first in major American literature to be written throughout in vernacular English so there's some books like I point to Frankenstein where they wrote the way Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein the way she spoke. So when the monster finally is able to speak, he's speaking the aristocratic proper English, which is not how he would speak because he learned how to speak by watching a family of people who lived in the woods while he hid in their shed. That's how he learned how to speak. They're not going to speak aristocratic, proper English. They're going to speak whatever hillbilly speak would be 
from England. Yeah. Plus, one of the women in it was an aristocrat, but she wasn't from England. She was from like India or some shit. I don't. I haven't read Frankenstein in a little bit, but I know she wasn't from there. So he would have been learning all these different dialects and all these different um, languages and and just ways to accent different things. But she had him speak in the way that she spoke, which it's a great story. It always kind of annoyed me. But when he when we say that uh, this was written throughout in vernacular English, he wrote it the way the people in the story would speak. Mostly how Huck Finn would speak because uh, the whole thing is told in first person by Huck Finn. He narrates pretty much the whole thing. It is a direct sequel to Tom Sawyer, even though he did write some between the two. Uh, it's noted for his colorful de- description of people and places along the Mississippi River. It's set in a society that ceased to exist over 20 years before the book was even published. Uh, the book was criticized when it was released because of its extensive use of coarse language throughout the 20th century. And despite arguments that the protagonists of the book are anti-racist, the criticism of the book continues due to it both perceived use of racial stereotypes and the frequent use of a very specific racial slur that I will not say, nor there, neither should anybody say. Uh, so it's not going to be brought up on this show. It starts with an N. But I mean, you didn't even have to say that. Everybody that, knows that was what the you were name talking. of a main character. It was mm, Jim. That was his name. So. I can understand why you wouldn't want kids reading it because they don't, you don't want them to know that word, but it was a huge part of the time, especially, especially when he wrote it for, because I mean, he, he wrote it when he wrote it, but it was set 20 years in the past. So it was, it was even a bigger thing then. Uh, it was written in two short bursts. First was in 1876 Twain wrote about 400 pages that he would tell his friends he liked only tolerably well, as far as I've gotten, and may possibly pigeonhole or burn the manuscript. So he he wrote it. He wasn't real fond of what he wrote, and he was he was damn near ready to just set the whole thing on fire and say, fuck it. I've been working on my novel for years, and I'm still, I'm not happy with it. Nope. It turned, from, from my research going into this, I found out most authors start off thinking that what they are writing is like the for the first hundred pages they think they're geniuses. Everything after that they think they are fucking garbage, and then they finish it, and then they realize that somebody comes along and helps them. A publisher comes along and, and and shows them the way, helps you know edit it, and it turns out to be a masterpiece. But he was he was no he wasn't unlike most authors who well, we write all this shit. And then you think it's shit. Uh, he stopped working on it for several years to write uh, The Prince and the Pauper, Life on the Mississippi. In 1882, Twain took a steamboat ride on the Mississippi from New Orleans to Minnesota with a stop in Hannibal. It must have inspired him because he dove into finishing Huckleberry Finn. Now, much like how there was a real Tom Sawyer that Twain based Tom Sawyer on, Uh, It was once said that Huck is based on Tom Blankenship, a childhood friend whose father, Woodson Blankenship, was a poor drunken and likely the model for Pop Finn. Quote, In Huckleberry Finn, I have drawn Tom Blankenship exactly how he was. He was ignorant, unwashed, insufficiently fed, but he had as good a heart as ever any boy had. Twain may have been telling one of his tales here because in 1885, when the Minneapolis Tribune asked who Huck was based on, Twain said it was no single person, quote, I could not point out to you the youngster in, in a lump, but still his story is what I call a true story. Huck Finn was first banned in Concord, Massachusetts in 1885 and continues to be one of the most challenged books. The objections are usually over the N-word, which occurs over 200 times in the book. Others say that the portrayal of African Americans is stereotypical, racially insensitive, or flat-out racist. In 2011, 
Stephen Railton, a professor at uh, the University of Virginia, published a version of the book that replaced the word with slave. Not, I mean... That's not really better. I mean, I guess it's more PC, but it's not any better. It's a word that you're allowed to say, but it, it doesn't make it a better word. I hate when they ban books because, yes, I can see how, you know, the entire race of people is upset about it, but... I believe they should be able to teach that in school when they're teaching about slavery. You know, have kids read that book so they learn how that guy felt because he explains in the book that he doesn't like being called that. Yeah, pe- kids are going to hear that word regardless of whether or not they read the book. I I knew that word from music and TV before I was 10. Yeah. So it's something that... Rappers use that word that in their music all I would, the time. I, I hate that they banned it. I don't agree with banning books, pre- any books, what the content is. The problem is that it's we as a society need to teach the kids what is right and what is wrong. Like if you get a, give a kid Huck Finn, you say, see all these words that start with an N? It's in the book, but it means this. It's a horrible thing. You should never say it because of everything that is behind that. It's it's not a good word. Don't use it. The same way you would a kid would find a copy of Mein Kampf somewhere and you should go, "Oh yeah, this guy wrote it. He's a piece of shit. We fought him in World War II. If you read it, just keep in mind that Jews aren't the enemy." And neither the, are gays and blacks and 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 the Nazis are horrible. Yes. So I'm 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 completely against banning books, no matter what the books. It's up to us to make sure children know the content and not not tell them what to believe, but guide them it's, into it's making sure they're not. It's kind of similar to banning it because it's art. Whenever there's nudity in art and nudity in pornography i mean i know they're not the same thing but yeah like that who, who's a uh was it who's the the artist that drew vaginas on everything it was o'keefe george o- george o'keefe okay so it, it'd be like oh, oh well you're not allowed to put this stuff up because half your paintings look like they're vaginas oh, so so what it's still art still art i mean that's they... that, that listen that's our opinion you have your own opinion please Opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one, and most of them stink. Uh, now, the next part, I'm not... You want to replace the N-word with the word slave, whatever. This next part, though, I think is even more uh, disrespectful. Soon after that appeared the hipster Huckleberry Finn. The word was replaced with hipster. The book's description says, and I quote... What the fuck? The adventures of Huckleberry Finn are now neither offensive nor uncool shut the fuck shut the fuck up <laughs> they made a hipster version of huckleberry finn well they they return they they changed all the n words to the word hipster so he was hipster jim i imagine they gave him a tight man bun and a nice and a groom beard look i have Why not long just hair name him a hobo jim because he wasn't a hobo but he wasn't a hipster either no, but he will. He hobo would work better. Be- How about we just fucking call him Jim? How about just Jim? How about we just take the N word out of it completely and we just fucking call him Jim? That would be ideal. But I mean, because- how about not change a literary god's writing at all? A lot of people fuck with Tom- with Mark Twain's writings. You'll see that most most people have good intentions. They, they he writes some stuff that doesn't get finished, and they want to help finish it, so they kind of take it to where. Uh, they think it's going to go. Mostly people who know who knew him, but um, it's very difficult to get in the mind of espe- someone like him, especially especially someone like him. Uh, but it's out there. If you want to look it up, it's the hipster of Huckleberry Finn. Uh, have fun. I can't imagine I will ever read no that. fucking way. Uh, in 1905, the Brooklyn Public Library removed Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer from the shelves because, as a librarian wrote to Tom, Huck is, quote, a deceitful boy who said sweat when he should have said perspiration. (laughs) 
Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> he's deceitful because he said a smart word instead of a dumb word? He said sweat instead of perspiration. So again, kids, kids now, and especially kids back then, they weren't going, oh, I'm perspiring. No, saying, I did. I had an adoptive grandpa when I would use vocabulary words that I was learning in English in like sixth grade and early junior high, he would say, oh, that's a quarter word. And I was like, okay. You told me about this. Yes. What's a dollar word? And he's like, he was like, read the dictionary. So I would read the dictionary to learn bigger words to make my vocabulary more articulate to earn money. Yeah. And that's why I'm so well-spoken today. And I mean, Mike, I did the something similar with my kids when i would change my daughter's diaper i would say oh this is horrendous oh this is horrible instead of "Ooh, this is icky or "Ooh, blah 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 and my 10 year old daughter yeah, most people don't say Ick. i mean i would be like you're fucking gross kid or ew this is <laughs> gross you know and then our but, our daughter starts saying fucking gross and then, and then no and but she us. when she was four and five she had an articulate vocabulary too a little too articulate because she's mouthy. very mouthy, yes. <laughs> and I blame you for that. <laughs> yes, but I mean, she's she's smarter than normal kids her age because she, of her vocabulary. She knows a, she knows a lot of big words, and she has put me on my place plenty of times. Hey guys, it's Stephanie. I'm here to tell you about Anchor. It's the easiest way to make a podcast, and it's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will also distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more platforms. You can make money from your podcast too with no minimum amount of listeners. It is everything you need to make a podcast in one place. All you have to do is download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Now, um... Twain's reply to this, and, and what do you think his reply is going to be? Happy, sad, mad, disgusted, overjoyed. What do you think his reply is going to be? With as weird as he is, I think he'll be okay with it. Like, sure, what the fuck? Do whatever you want. All right. Dear sir, I am greatly troubled by what you say. I wrote Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn for adults exclusively and always distressed me when I found that boys and girls have been allowed access to them. The mind that becomes soiled in youth can never again be washed clean. I know this by my own experience, and to this day I cherish an unpleasably bitterness against the unfaithful guardians of my young life, who not only permitted but compelled me to read an expurgated Bible, though before I was 15 years old. None can do that and ever draw a clean, sweet breath again this side of the grave. Ask that young lady, she will tell you so. Most honestly, do I wish I could say a softening word or two in defense of Huck's character, since you wish it. But really, in my opinion, it is no better than those of Solomon, David, Satan, and the rest of the sacred brotherhood. If there is an expurgated Bible in the children's department, won't you please help that young woman remove Huck and Tom from that questionable companionship? Sincerely yours, S.L. Clemens. That sounds like a, a, a joke, like he's saying, fuck you. No, it's not. He did not. And we will get, there is a story that we will get to in a little bit about somebody, a, a child coming up to Twain and telling him how much he loved Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. And Mark Twain pretty much berates him like an old school teacher and tells him not to read those books. They weren't for him and points him in the direction of another book. Oh, uh, that's bullshit. Yeah, there is no he, age limit on books. He truly believed that Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn were not good reading material for young boys and girls and pointed to another book of his that was what was his favorite that he wrote later in life. That there was one book that he wrote that we will get to. It is The Obsession that I have been talking, hinting, Ooh, yay, hinting to excited. you for a month, and then I hinted towards it last week, uh, and we will get to that. In a little bit. Um, but no, he, he wrote Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn for adults. Because he felt like adults could com, could grasp. They were already set. Adults were already the way they were going to be. And he didn't want kids reading Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. And 
deciding, oh, I'm going to be like these guys instead of like being like themselves. But didn't he think that in the 1800s, if you were an, ad an adult, you probably didn't know how to read back then because they didn't did have a lot of schools? He has a quote. Uh, the man who won't read is no better is no better prepared than the man who can't read. Right. He wrote these for people who wanted to read. If you couldn't read or you didn't read it, it then fine. But he wrote these for people who did know how to read. Yeah, and then you have a whole bunch of kids who are learning how to read in that age. And he didn't want them to learn how with Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. But they're going to they're going to read through there's not much reading but material back then. He didn't write it for school. He didn't expect them to be in, in school libraries. He wrote it for adults. So for There's him public to find, libraries, though. But he didn't expect for them to be in the ch children's section. That's not, definitely not how, he, how it was pushed when, it was, when Huck Finn was published. Now, from 1884 to the end of February 1885, Sam undertook another lecture tour through North America where, with George Washington Cable through the East and Midwest. Damn, how many George Washington blanks are there? Well, it was a big name. He was, he was, it was, it was <laughs> George Washington, still really fresh in people's minds. It, you know, it, it was less than a hundred years ago when all the when he was around. So uh, it's it's still, a, you know, and nowadays we name kids after uh, Game of Thrones characters. <laughs> There's more Khaleesi's than there are Marys. So, or Harry Potter characters or BTS band members. So in early 1886. Sam bought half interest in the, in the Page Compositor uh, as an automatic typesetting machine. He began investing in the machine in 1880, soon after a meeting with inventor James Page in Hartford. Sam and Page's partner now supported his work at the rate of $3,000 a month. Damn. Back then, what do you think that would be now? Probably about $25,000 a 80? month. Thousand, just over eighty thousand dollars a month. And, Clemens is rolling in the dough. But he's a horrible business. There's only one good business decision that he that I have found that he really made that he he will make. Um, this is not it. Uh, eighty thousand dollars a month. The first working model of the compositor was built in 1887 through the. Uh, it was a third faster than its competition, the linotype, uh, but it was unreliable. And even though he was frustrated by delays, Sam was repeatedly convinced by Page to continue investing. So the, the inventor is like, well, I know it's fucking up a lot, but just keep giving me money and I'll get it fixed. And Sam's just, okay. And he does it. You want to go back in time and, and slap him uh, because... Because it will drain him pretty dry. Hindsight's twenty twenty. I suppose. Uh, now, for another big one, as far as I'm concerned, this is the biggest one, to me, this is the biggest one that isn't Tom Sawyer or Huck Finn. Uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. This is one of those that I've known about almost as long as I've known about Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. Uh, it's published in 1889. Uh in the book, a Yankee engineer from Connecticut named Hank Morgan receives a severe blow to the head and is somehow transported in time and space to England during the reign of King Arthur. King Arthur. I should know how to say Arthur. I know a man named Arthur. He's my father. <laughs> After some initial confusion and his capture by one of Arthur's knights, Hank realizes that he is actually in the past and he uses his knowledge to make people believe that he is a powerful magician. Yeah, which, who hasn't sat there and thought, God, if I could take what I know now and go back in time, I would be a god. Yeah, I think everybody's like anytime, had that thought. Like, anytime I watch anything on, like, medieval war, it's like, God, I, if I could go back with, like, an AK, I'd rule that fucking place. <laughs> yeah. Or go back, go back to the times of the Black Death with penicillin or something. <laughs> Any plague and have any <laughs> antibiotic. You'd you they put you you'd be like C three PO to the Ewoks. You'd be a god. Uh, oh fuck. Was, okay, he uh he attempts to modernize the past in order to make people's lives better, but in the end he is unable to prevent the death of King Arthur, and an interdict against him by the Catholic Church of the time grow uh they grow fearful and power uh, they grow fearful of his power. Sorry. Uh, now, an interdict is uh, Catholic canon law 
It is an existential censure or ban that prohibits persons, certain activity, church, individuals, or groups from participating in certain rites, or that the rights and services of the church are banished from having validity in certain territories for a limited or extended time. So it's pretty much the, the Catholic Church saying, no God for you. No God, no God for you. Yeah, no comment. <laughs> I mean, and the whole the, the whole interdict, the whole Catholic saying that, oh well, you you didn't you did something we didn't like, so this is how it's going to be, and and you know you know God for you. I mean, that's one of the reasons Martin Luther posted his shit on the door. That's that's one of the reasons the church that people split from the Catholic Church because of all the stupid rules. You have a God, you should be able to worship him wherever, whenever, without somebody telling you yes or no. That's a different podcast. I with, don't want to get into that. Uh, which, at some point, hopefully, you'll be able to hear uh, here on the Audio Parfait Podcast Network. But for right now, uh, not Back yet. to Twain. Yeah. Twain wrote the book after being inspired by a dream in which he was a knight himself severely inconvenienced by the weight and cumbersome nature of his armor. It is among several of his works that mark the transition from the Gilded Age to the Progressive Era. It's also also cited as a formative example of the time travel genre, which I don't, I mean, I can't, Jules Verne, probably the only other person back then that was really writing time travel shit. I can't think of anybody else. Yeah, I, I don't think I can either. Uh, uh, Jules Verd, somebody that we will cover at some point down the road. He's a big one. Um, about now, the financial situation was becoming serious. Uh, the page compositor in which to in which Twain had invested a hundred thousand dollars, or just over a million, two point five million today. Damn. Yeah, Webster and Company, his publishing house. And the cost of maintaining the Nook Farm lifestyle at the Hartford House in Connecticut were bringing him to the brink of personal bankruptcy. To reduce their living costs, Sam closed down the Hartford House and in June of 1891 took the family to Europe to live in France, Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. Now, don't you love it how when you're just on the verge of bankruptcy, you just decide to live in four or, yeah, Four of the most beautiful places in Europe. I mean, I remember that time we didn't have any money. We said, "Fuck it, we should just move to Spain." Yeah, let's <laughs> let's let's go to Greece. We have no money. Uh, I mean, he always had something coming in. He was always writing. He was always doing something. He uh, he was always able to find a way to make money, which is something you got to give him credit for. But he's always able to find a way to lose it too. So it's really frustrating. Uh, the American Claimant, published 1892. Uh, Twain wrote the novel with the help of phonographic dictation. Now, can you hear our cat? That's the thing about quarantine is every time you listen to a podcast now, you hear somebody's fucking animal in the background. I had to take off our dog's collar because it jingled every time you walked by, which you could probably hear in the last episode. And now we have a cat who's in heat that won't shut the fuck up. She's cute, but... She is. She needs to knock it off. <laughs> Anyway, this was uh, a novel that he got help. He wrote with the help of phonographic dictation. It was the dictation machine that he played on a phonograph. Uh, the first author, according to Twain, to do so. This was also, according to Twain, an attempt to write a book without the mention of weather. Yeah, even though the first sentence of the second paragraph is "fine breezy morning." So huh. he, he goes into a book to not write about the weather. Second paragraph, writes about the fucking weather. Um, but all the weather is contained in, a, in an appendix in the back of the book, which the reader is encouraged to turn to from time to time. So, I mean, okay, it's kind of a cop-out. I'm not going to write about the weather. Uh, if you want to know what the weather is like, you go to the back of the book. It'll tell you. Kind of... I don't know. It seems silly. I guess it was a big thing. It seems silly to me, but you know, I mean, Dr. Seuss wrote what Green Eggs and Ham because it was it was a bet on if he could write a book with with fifty words or less. With I ju that was just fifty words. That was it was Green Eggs and Ham. I thought that was one fish, two fish. No, I think it was Green Eggs and Ham. He was 
he was bet that he couldn't write a book with just 50 words and then he came up with with that which which i mean it's got more than 50 words because some of the words are repeated but only 50 different oh, words okay yeah, yeah yeah uh it's a comedy of mistaken identity and multiple role switches uh the cast of characters include an american enamored of british hereditary autocracy and a british earl entranced by american democracy so again it's a role switching story something you see in prince and the pauper so was ideas kind of coming stale at this point he's getting up there in age or was he just really into role playing and his wife not giving it to him <laughs> but he was gone all the time livy probably wanted it but he couldn't give it because he was always fucking gone on lecture tours. Well, he had to make the money he was losing. He did have to make the money. Quit losing the fucking money. Quit doing investments and things. Or when, when something starts losing money, get out instead of putting $2.5 million into the fucking thing. It, oh, it is what it is. Uh, he returned to New York often on business, and in the fall of 1893, he met Henry Huddleston Rogers, vice president of Standard Oil Company and one of the wealthiest industrialists in America. Rogers admired Tom, uh, Twain's writings and helped him with his finances. This was just after the collapse of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, that June in 1894, the failure of the West Webster Company loomed. Some publications had not paid. Uh, a, book cup, a bookkeeper had embezzled $25,000, which is, take, well, I guess on how much that is. It's a lot of, I mean, for an embezzlement, it's a lot of fucking money. A million? Seven, just over 720000 So you're close. That's a lot of money to, to have somebody just steal from you. And Sam had used company assets for the page compositor. Uh, Sam, and Rogers, Sam gave Rogers power of attorney, which Rogers used to transfer all of Sam's copyrights to his wife, Livy. And when Webster and Company went bankrupt... Rogers and Livy declared the company were declared the company's primary creditor, so it kind of it kept his name off of it. Uh, that year, Sam finally abandoned the page compositor after a second model was tested unsuccessful at the Chicago Herald. So it took all that time for him to finally say, "I can't do it anymore. It's not going to work," and stop giving uh, James Page money for this fucking thing. So you get two chances, and then that's it. Yeah. Well, he, it, it didn't work a second time, but that that's like full-fledged testing. Like, okay, we're going to put out there, we're going to print a bunch of stuff. It didn't work. So they reworked it, and then they did it again, and it didn't work. But all that time in between, it was failed attempt after failed attempt after failed attempt, unreliable. A apparently, you had to go in. It was all... Uh, Oh, fuck, how do I want to say it? it? It was all just kind of a crapshoot. You, you would go in and you try it, and if it worked, great. If not, you had, to, you had to readjust everything and then try again. And if it didn't work, you'd have to readjust everything and then try again. It was one of those. So if one thing was messed up, you had to pretty much redo the whole fucking thing. So it was, it was really unreliable. And the fact that it took him that long to, to get away from it is really fucking annoying. Well, yeah, but he was he he wasn't nearby to keep tabs on it, and he hired somebody who if, probably didn't know what the fuck they were doing. If you're putting that much money into something, you keep a fucking eye on it, or hire someone to keep an eye on it for well, you. Well, when he met Henry, uh, when he met Rogers, he finally had somebody to help him with that stuff. Yeah. Now here's a book that I personally had never heard of: Puddinhead Wilson. Not pudding head, Puddinhead with an apostrophe between the D and the N. Uh, published in 1894, its central intrigue revolves around two boys, one born into slavery with a 132nd black ancestry, the other white, born to be the master of the house. Can you can you tell where this is going to where this is going? Slavery? No. Yeah, well, it does it does focus a little bit on on slavery, but it's a it's a concept that he has done at least twice oh, already. Role reversal. The two boys who look similar are switched at infancy. Each grows into each other's social roles. Again, he had a re he had he liked pre Civil War stuff, and he liked role reversal. It, I, I don't know. 
the story was serialized in the Century Magazine from 1893 to 1894 before being published as a novel in uh, 1894. It covers everything from small town politics and religion to slavery and racism. And a strange twist is the title character, Puddinhead Wilson, isn't really even a main character. He quickly falls to the side for the bigger story as it unfurls, although he does come back near the end of the book to play a fairly significant role. So it's like the movie Oscar with, I think of Oscar with Sylvester Stallone. One of my favorite movies of all time. It's named Oscar because there's a guy in it named Oscar that you don't meet until the last like two minutes of the movie. Yeah, so it's about the title character, but you never see the title character. Yeah, well, it's not even about him. The movie's not about him at all. He plays a, a very small part. It, it's, a, it's, it's not a role reversal one. It's, it's, um, everybody's got these own little stories going on, and they all kind of interconnect in some way, and, and a lot of people like just barely missing each other and all this shit. And uh, Oscar is the chauffeur, chauffeur who um, knocked up Sylvester Stallone's daughter, but she was lying. She said, oh, the, the, the chauffeur knocked me up but she's not pregnant and she never did anything with oscar she just used him as an excuse to piss her father off so um she ends up marrying somebody else at the end of the movie at the wedding oscar shows up and they're like who are you oscar i'm the chauffeur and then they go after him because he he started the whole thing which really he didn't have anything to do with the fucking movie i love that movie God, I love that fucking movie. It sounds like I need to watch it. I thought you had. I thought we had watched it together before. We will find it and we will watch it. I love it. It's my favorite Sylvester Stallone movie. Over all the Rambos, over all the Rockies, it is my favorite. I have a weird taste in movies. If it's not funny or scary, I usually don't give a shit about it. I mean, I thought you had watched it, but we'll find it at some point. And uh, we will watch it. Now, um... Let's see, now i got to find my place again as we went off on our little tangent. Uh, Twain originally envisioned the character characters of Luigi and Angelo Capello as conjoined twins, modeled after the late 19th century conjoined twins, Giovanni and Giacomo Tocci. I'm sure I'm fucking those names completely up because I'm not Italian and I don't speak it. Uh, he planned for them to be the central characters of the novel, to be titled Those Extraordinary Twins. But during that writing process, Twain, Twain realized that the secondary characters, such as Puddinhead Wilson, Roxy, and Tom Driscoll, were taking a more central role in the story. Puddinhead, Puddinhead Wilson taking a central role at the very beginning, when he first moves to the town, and at the very end, uh, when he is defending the people in the story. More importantly, he found that the serious tone of the story of Roxy and Tom clashed unpleasantly with the light tone of the twins' story, as he explained in the, induct the introduction of those extraordinary twins, which he would kind of write later. The defect turned out to be the one already spoken of, two stories on one, a farce and a tragedy. So I pulled out the farce and left the tragedy. This left the original team in, but only as mere names, not as characters. Uh, we've heard of a lot of other authors that do this. Um, Stephen King's big on starting a story and then everything just, the, the characters kind of take a life of their own and he goes a different way than what he had originally planned. Uh, half of the yes. gun, half of the uh, Dark Tower series, he said that he kind of let the story uh, write itself. He was just, he was just putting pen to paper, but the story was writing itself. Um, I've never written a book, so I don't know how that works, but apparently it works pretty well because Twain knew what he was doing. Uh, the characters of Luigi and Angelo remain in Puddinhead Wilson as twins with separate bodies. Twain's was, Twain was not thorough in his separation of the twins, and there are hints in the final version of their conjoined origin, such as the fact that they were their parents' only child. Uh, they slept together, which isn't a you know strange thing. Uh, they play piano together, and they had an early career as sideshow performers. Uh, those extraordinary twins 
was published as a short story with glosses, glossy inserts into the text where the narrative was either unfinished or would have duplicate parts of Puddin, duplicated parts of Puddinhead Wilson. So he did end up writing those extraordinary twins, but it just wasn't the long novel he had planned on for that. Tom Sawyer Abroad was published in 1894. I honestly don't have a ton to say about this. It's, it's Tom, Huck, and Jim, and a parody of adventure, adventure stories told like those of Jules Verne. Riding around, going around the world in hot air balloon, all that stuff. Um, it's told in first-person narrative from Huck, just like Huckleberry Finn was. Uh, also, Tom Sawyer Detective in 1896, also told first story narrative from Huck. Um, Tom attempts to solve a mysterious murder. Uh, it wouldn't be a Huck Finn story without a little controversy behind it. In 1909, Danish schoolmaster Vladimir Thorison claimed in an article in the magazine Maneds, Ma Maneds, Ma I'm not Dutch, I'm, I'm not Danish. The plot of the book had been plagiarized from Steen Blitcher's story, The Vicar of Wheelby. Uh, Bleacher's work had been translated into German, but not into English, and Twain's secretary wrote Mr. Thoris in a letter stating, Mr. Clemens is not familiar with Danish and does not read German fluently and has not read the book you mention, nor any translation or a adaptation of what he is aware of. The matter constitutes constituting Tom Sawyer Detective is original with Mr. Clemens, who has never consciously been a plagiarist. So, it's like, well, I didn't, if he stole the story, he doesn't know. He didn't do it on purpose. Because he doesn't speak the language. Because he doesn't speak the language. And he barely understands German, which yeah. is fairly close to Dutch, but not enough to understand it. Yeah. Uh, this is the version of Tom that we see in The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, a movie with... Uh, Sean Connery. The, the movie the movie people say was so bad it killed his career. Uh, most people hate it, and even though the plot is pretty bad and the CGI is subpar, I, again, love that movie. <laughs> I also love Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which a lot of people out there who are listening to this right now uh, who are Indiana Jones fans are probably going, fuck you, but I like it. I had fun. I'm not much of a Shia LaBeouf fan, but I don't know. It, I enjoyed myself. And I still enjoy myself when I watch it. Oh, well, it was about aliens. Raiders of the Lost Ark was about the fucking Ark of the Covenant. To me, that's just the science fiction-y as aliens coming down. The Temple of the Doom, the guy's ripping hearts out. It's, it's all fucking science fiction. So just get your head out of your ass and just enjoy it. It's an alien. It's, it's about aliens. I mean, it's not about aliens. Aliens end up being... Oh, spoiler alert if you haven't seen... Uh, yeah, Kingdom you're, the, you're supposed, Kingdom, to, least, you're supposed yeah, to say that at the beginning. If you haven't seen Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which came out like, what, 11 years ago? something. It came out the same time the first Iron Man came out. If you haven't seen it by now, then you weren't a big enough Indiana Jones fan to watch it in the first place. So I don't care. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a story. And it, we, we finally get to this obsession Yay! About uh, time. Any idea what it could be before I get into it? Any idea? At all? I'll give you a hint. It's a person. Is it another author? No. Oh. But it's a person. A person. His brother. No, 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 no. I have no idea. Okay. Well, let's get to it. I'm going to tell you a little story. I'm going to read I'm going to read it exactly how I found it. Because I, I think it's put down perfectly. On a December night in 1905, the New York City chapter of the Society of Illustrators managed to do something many thought impossible. With one calculated stroke, they left Mark Twain, author and noted quipster, speechless. The writer had just risen to address the group. As he began to speak, a girl emerged from the back of the room. Her hair was cropped just below the air ears. Her face was angular but radiant. Underneath the ceremonial white robe, she wore the armor of a 15th century French soldier. With eyes fixed on the author, she glided up the aisle between the tables, carrying a laurel wreath atop a satin pillow. 
A reporter from the New York Times in attendance that night later wrote that the company smile, which we've all had that company smile, just so we know, but you know, yeah, you're perfect at it. Fuck off. <laughs> well, you are. You you have you have a good way of smiling, and people are like, oh, she's enjoying herself, and then afterwards, you just the smile comes off. You roll your eyes and go, that was fucking horrible. <laughs> So if you're ever around her and she's got a smile on her face, it doesn't necessarily mean she's enjoying herself. He wrote that the company smile Twain had exhibited for most of the ceremony faded. By the time the girl reached his table, Twain had every appearance of a man who had seen a ghost. His eyes fairly started out of his head. His hand gripped the edge of the table. She presented the author with the wreath and he accepted it wordlessly. He remained silent until the model exited the room. As the seconds ticked away, Twain's audience anxiously waited his response. When the writer finally spoke, he did so slowly and carefully. Now there's an illustration, gentlemen, a real illustration. I studied that girl, Joan of Arc, for 12 years, and it never seemed to me that uh, that the artists and writers gave us such a true picture of her. They drew a picture of a peasant. Her dress was that of a peasant. But they always missed the face, the divine soul, the pure character, the supreme woman, the wonderful girl. She was only 18 years old, but put into a breast like hers, a heart like hers, and I think, gentlemen, you would have a girl like that. Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Sieur Louis de Comte was published in 1896, in which Twain recounts the life of Joan of Arc. There's a lot of French words in here. If you're French and you're listening to this and I mess it up, please tweet or email us and let me know. Just berate me. I'm fine with it. Uh, Was that a surprise, Joan of Arc? Yes, Joan of Arc. So we had a boner for Joan of Arc. Well, he... I don't think Mark Twain really had a boner for anybody but his wife. But he... That was like his celebrity crush. He admired her for everything she went through for what she believed. That was a pretty big thing for him. People sticking up for what they believed, which is exactly what she did. She believed this. She believed an angel told her to to fight so that's what she did and she led the fucking army and she died for it it's twain's last completed novel published when he was 61. uh he will write some other stuff but being considered a novel this is pretty much the last one uh mark twain's obsession with joan of arc has has to rank among the most baffling and least talked about enigmas in american literature even for those entrenched within the competitive world of Twain's scholarship, stories like that are usually treated as interesting, but ultimately trifling anecdotes uh, illustrative of the eccentricities of a predictably unconventional man. Uh, according, to Twain, according to Twain's first biographer, Albert B. Payne, who actually lived with him for the latter part of his life, uh, and, and wrote down pretty much everything. He's a big part of the end of his life. You'll you'll hear more about him as we go along. Uh, in his later years, the author favored telling one particular story over the hundreds of other doozies he acquired over his lifetime. Uh, like most of Twain's true life anecdotes, this one flirted with exaggeration, though for all its apparent embellishments, listeners were more inclined to believe it, if only because they wanted to. It, uh, it's a good story, and I'm going to tell you how this all started. Uh, this all comes from Albert B. Payne himself. He wrote this down. As a young boy in Hannibal, Missouri, a wayward page from a tattered book once blew across young Samuel Clevin's path as he made his way home from a shift as an apprentice for a local printer. For reasons behind, beyond his understanding, the boy, then maybe 12 or 13, felt compelled to snatch the loose paper from the air. Reading down the page, he stopped in his tracks. Then he sought out a place to sit down on the ground where he could devour its every word. The scene, captured on that errant page, told of a young French girl caught in a desperate debate with a pair of English rogues. The girl was caged and wearing nothing but crude undergarments. 
the brutes who had stolen her clothes were doing their best to rile the prisoner to little avail. The boy then ran home and immediately began questioning his family about what on earth this mysterious heroine might have possibly done to be imprisoned within a cage. The family knew very little of her. Regardless, by the end of the night, there arose within Twain a deep compassion for the gentle maid of Orleans, a burning resentment toward her captors, a powerful and indestructible interest in her sad history. It was an interest that would grow steadily for more than half of a lifetime and culminate at last in the crowning work, The Recollection, the loveliest story ever told of the martyred girl. Mar martyred girl. Payne very clearly took Twain's story at face value. Modern scholars a little bit more skeptical, like, mm, that just happened across. But it's a good story, and it's, it's something you come across when you're young. Those types of things do kind of stick with you. Yeah. Longer. I mean, I think he had a celebrity crush on her like and with the impact with him being so young that it had on him it just grew into you know what we call today fandoms that was his fandom back then yeah, that's a possibility uh writing in his 1985 memoir our neighbor mark twain colby taylor a neighbor of twain's in redding connecticut where the author lived from 1908 until his death uh told the story of the day when he then a young boy approached the writer in order to profess his adulation for Twain's most famous characters, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. Upon hearing the boy's praises, the author suddenly took on the mend and vex as a vexed school teacher. Quote, You shouldn't read those books about bad boys, he told the child, wagging his figure in Taylor's face. My best book is my recollection recollections of Joan of Arc. The novel is presented as a translation by Jean-Francois Aldin of Memoirs by Louis de Conte, a fictionalized version of Joan of Arc's real page, Louis de Conte's. It's just, there's just an S at the end that changes it. And I, I know it's not Conte's, it's Conte's. With an O, not a U. So old time me, uh, Mark Twain's, get off my lawn and go read my good book, not the bad one. Yeah, something like that. I told you, he, he didn't want little kids reading Sawyer and Finn. He wanted them reading this because he wanted them to learn what a... What a true hero was about. Exactly. Uh, the novel is divided into three sections according to Joan of Arc's development. A youth in Domery, a commander of the army of Charles VII of France, and a defendant at the trial of Rouen. The novel was first published as a serialization in Harper's Magazine beginning in April 1895. Twain was aware of his reputation as a comic writer, and he asked that each installment appear anonymously so that readers would treat it seriously. Because at that time, if you saw that Mark Twain had written something, you're automatically going to go into it with this anticipation and idea that it's going to be satirical. Um, there's going to be a lot of plays on government and racism, and things are going to be funny. That's not what this is. It's like... It's like you go into a Stephen King book. Uh, I bring up Stephen King a lot because he's one of my favorites. Uh, he should be one of your favorites, too. Um, but you go into a Stephen King book expecting horror. You go into a Stephen King book expecting twists and turns. Like, okay, well, this, this, these two people, and they're in love, and they're having, you're waiting for, the, for the, the clown to jump out of the water and kill somebody. That's what, so if he's going to write something, uh, that's not going to be that, you'd almost have to use a pseudonym. Because the second you see Stephen, Stephen King, that's what you're going to be expecting. You go to an M. Night Shyamalan movie, you're expecting a, a twist. And if there's no twist, you're kind of let down. And so he knew that if people went into it knowing that he had written it, uh, he was afraid people weren't going to take it seriously as serious as, as he wanted them to take it. And he wanted them to take it very seriously. Uh, regardless, though, his authorship soon became known to the public, and Harper and Brothers published the book edition with his name in May 1896. So he tried. Yeah, I mean, what can you do other than try? He didn't have mo any money to pay his debts, even though many of his 96 creditors 
didn't really press him about it, and most of them agreed to settle for 50 cents to the dollar. So pay, half a, of- pay us half of what you owe us, and we're good. Uh, but he was determined to repay them in full. Henry Rogers arranged a, uh, a plan in 1895, 1896. Sam undertook his most extensive, extensive lecture tour ever all the way around the world. So, been going for a while. I think we will end part two there, and we will pick up next week with part three of Mark Twain. Now we're gonna we're gonna cover his trip around the world. Um, we're gonna cover some major blows to him personally. We're also gonna get into his friends. Um, I said in the beginning of part one that he was a lot of things including an inventor we will get to some of his inventions he had three patents we will cover all of them and uh, we will watch how he pulls a former president almost single-handedly from the brink of bankruptcy Uh, there's still there's still quite a bit to go we should finish everything Uh, part three of mark twain next week Yay! So, what do you th- what do you think so far about him? Is, is he living up to the hype? Yeah, I'm learning a lot more about Mark Twain than I ever thought I would ever know. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting, and, and I hope our listeners are enjoying it as well. Well, I hope so too. Um, I, you guys can get a hold of us uh, www.audioparfait.com. Audio Parfait. Audio uh, you can reach us at at Audio Parfait on Twitter. Audio Parfait on Instagram. We are uh, going to give your Twitter handle so people get a hold of you. At ECJBAT on Instagram and Twitter. I am at Y-O-U-N-G-E-T-A-M. That's Young E-T-A-M on, I believe, Instagram and Twitter. I really need to check my fucking social media and (laughs) and make sure I know. (laughs) I'm giving people a lot of information that might be wrong, but that's... That's why this, I'm in charge of networking. This information might be wrong. The information about Twain isn't. But th- uh, information about me, maybe. because I He doesn't even know himself. I, I, I know everything. Yeah. Just um, listen to me. <laughs> you can email us at info at audioparfait.com. I know that one's right because I've typed it out more times than I can count in the past <laughs> week. Um, and just let us know what you think. Any If there's any authors you want us to cover, we have a handful that are coming up in the coming weeks. Um, but, but after that, we're completely open. Anybody you want us to cover, any major books written that you want us to cover, let us know. We're open to all suggestions. We want to make this as, as good as possible. And don't worry, I will be working on a series for Miss J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter. And Kevin has never read the books. So. I haven't. I haven't. This will be fun because I've never read. I've seen all the movies. Parts of some of them, not in entirety i'm i've seen all of the movies it's just what parts of them i was paying attention to or conscious for i cannot remember i know the last two i watched in full well yeah because i took you to the midnight premiere with me you will know that was twilight no i took you to the midnight premiere i didn't go see the midnight premiere of harry potter you dragged me to the midnight premiere premiere of the last part of twilight which, which you keep telling everybody that i said i liked I never. I'm gonna. Get you this said on, you liked a part. I will. Ne- I'll get this on record now, and however many people hear this over the next coming years, all the way until the aliens come down and and kill us all. I didn't like the last Twilight movie. I said the fight scene was pretty good. <laughs> Those were my exact words. <laughs> the fight scene was pretty good. When they started killing everybody, again, spoiler alert if you haven't seen the final Twilight. Uh, at the end, when they start killing everybody and you start freaking out, the only thing going through my mind is she is going to be horrible to live with for the next God knows how long. And then it all turned out to just be a vision, and you took an audible, oh, along with about 90% of the theater. So I went, oh, there's a lot of other guys in here that are probably relieved that they're not going to have to listen to their women bitch about this movie. Which one of the Fantastic Beasts did you go see with I didn't me? go see any of them with you. No, you, you did. I went to both of them by I myself. Didn't go, I didn't go see. We've gone, we go see Marvel movies together. Yes. Other than that, we don't really go see any movies together. We've seen a few comedies and Date a few movies. horrible mo- uh, horror movies. 
mostly we go see Marvel movies together because they're superior in every way to everything, period. But yes, the Harry, the Harry Potter should be interesting because he doesn't know anything, and now he's making fun of me. We probably will not cover Twilight because... We can cover it at some point somewhere down the line. I'm sure that we can... Co- I want There are other I'm, Stephanie I'm Meyer hope, books I'm out there. I'm hoping that we can cover more bygone authors, just because if you cover an author who's still alive and still fairly young... I mean, J.K. Rowling's not in her 30s, but she's not old by any means. No, but there's a lot of controversy we can go over with True. right now. True, but with... A series of books I don't mind. Uh, authors, I'm going to try to stay more towards the ones that are were here and gone. Just because, well, like if we had done this five years ago with Harper Lee, we would have to turn right back around and go, oh, by the way, she's dead now because she was alive. So I don't want to have to go back and say, oh, well, this change, you know, something, you know, who knows if one of our favorite authors that is, you know, aging but not dead all of a sudden it turns out they're just this horrible person and now we have to cover that instead of just saying they live, you know, tell everything, they died. And I don't have to do that. So I will be covering mostly uh, authors who aren't here anymore. Some of them will still be here, but they'll be old enough to where hopefully we won't find find out anything completely damning about them. I will be doing both authors that are currently alive and have passed. And, and I want to cover some infamous books. Uh books that a lot of people probably won't want us to cover just because of their nature but I feel it's important that people know exactly what's in them so they know where the fight is uh Mein Kampf at some point probably Anarchist Cookbook uh at some point probably uh fucking Fifty Shades of Grey I mean we should no fuck no No. I mean, everybody should. I haven't read that. I'm not going to read that. No. Are we going to cover Danielle Steele at some point? Do you want to? I don't know. I need to look her. I don't know if she's had it. Because that's. I don't dabble in romance novels. I'm not worried about their books so much. Because we're going to cover a couple people who I've never read their books before. Just as an author? But But covering them as a person because that's what we're doing with Twain we're 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 telling you about his books we're telling you about what's in them what they're about his writing process you know you know all that stuff but it's more about his life as far as we Daniel Steele could have a a crazy life for all we know yeah that would Um, be interesting and she's written a lot of fucking books yeah and she's made a lot of fucking money off of writing a lot of fucking books a lot of romance books so maybe she's not getting a lot of sexual um, loving at home I don't know if you want us to write about Danielle Steele, please let us know. <laughs> if if we get enough people saying, yes, cover Danielle Steele, I will cover Danielle Steele. <laughs> oh, my God. I will. I will do the fucking research. I will write a goddamn paper on Danielle. We will do five parts on Danielle Steele. <laughs> <laughs> if we need to. If the people want it, I'm going to give them what they want because that's what we're here for. To, we, you learn from us when we learn from you. Basically, what we're saying is we want you to open a fucking book. Read. Learn. Yes. So from now to the next time we get to talk to you, do yourself a favor. Open a fucking book. Have a good week. Take care of each other. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.